uh, last is here as uh, in the Helen Lecture series, which is a prestigious series. We bring the best uh, possible professors from around the world to uh, tell us their stories. And uh, this is the same. Normally they give uh, two lectures. This is the second one, perhaps a little less to the popular crowd, uh, which is our, this is our weekly seminar. And uh, I asked to print the CV, so it was uh, a heavy book. <laughs> so we're going to do it the Israeli way. So it's a stellar CV, and uh, it was uh, hard to read. It's hard to read to you all the prizes and awards, over 210 publications um, on the board, the editor board of uh, PLOS Biology for many years and a leader in the field. Most recently work on, uh, I would say, breaking borders on work on uh, insect cognition with uh, many beautiful uh, papers. So Lars is a professor at Queen's uh, Mary University of London. And thank you very much for coming here. And we look forward to your talk. All right, thank you very much for your very kind invitation and introduction. Um, so those of you who were here last time will know that I'll start with my acknowledgements. I'll do that again because the names are um, different. So the people who've discussed and worked with me on all of this stuff are Jeremy Niven, Santa Fernando, Joe Woodgate, James Makinson, and Mark Roper, mostly. There are some other names that will come up along the way. Um, so I've before I switch back to really big brain things like bees, um, there's a reason why I've put this thing up here. That's a, uh, it's, a, it's a miniature parasitoid wasp. I've told you a little bit about parasitoid wasp spatial memory um, in the last lecture. This is a, a rather small um, specimen or species, um, so-called fairy wasps. And you can see in this comparison here that the whole insect there um, is actually smaller than, than a single-celled paramecium. Um, yet, of course, so the, the whole, it's also about the same scale. The whole brain is about the size of a, a bed cell in the human um, cortex. Um, so they are really small, um, but they still, of course, have a compound eye, they have an antenna, they have a brain. Um, and, of course, they have the whole range of behaviors that need to be supported, locomotion, um, host search, of a position site search, mate search, and so on. And some, this species hasn't been tested for long and short term memory, but some slightly um, larger species have. Um, so there are some really, really small things that can still do quite amazing things. Um, but they're off the scale here, these fairy wasps. Um, but this is just lumping everything together. Everyone's body sizes and everyone's brain sizes from the kinds of little things that interest me, marked in red, these are insects, um, to medium and large-brained, um, large brain, uh, mast and large-brained um, animals such as humans and elephants and whales. We're um, near the top, we're by no means at the top. There are larger and larger-brained animals in the animal kingdom. Um, but Overall, if you take this broad view, then the best predictor of um, an animal's brain size is just how large the animal is. The larger you are, the larger the, your brain. And um, so we're by no means at the top, but I guess from the um, idea that uh, we perceive ourselves as relatively intelligent um, and are near the top, there is a common perception that larger brains are, um, are better for certain things than smaller brains. And indeed, people have generated lots and lots of correlations um, from a variety of animal species that seem to show that um, you can correlate brain size with all kinds of things, such as say, social group size. I commented on about, about that a bit last time. Uh, the existence of tactical deception in primates, female promiscuity in bats, innovation and tool use in primates, um, plus more than 60 other correlations. Um, if you give me 15 minutes, I could probably calculate you a correlation between brain size and the volume of farts or something like that. It's actually it's an, it's an, it's an easy field. Um, 
because um, you don't have to collect any data. All the vertebrate brain sizes are already out there, um, and you can just, um, um, of course, um, take your pick and find um, if you can generate a correlation. Um, the field got off to a bad start, I think, um, after um, this quotation that I'm about to read to you. I think they should probably have stopped. Anyway, this is um, Gustave Le Bon, who was a student of Broca, so the Broca's area person. And he says this about brain sizes. In the most intelligent races, there are a large number of women whose brains are closer in size to those of gorillas than to the most developed male brains. This inferiority is so obvious that no one can t contest it for a moment. Only its degree is worth discussion. All psychologists who have studied the intelligence of women recognize today that they represent the most inferior forms of human evolution and that they're closer to children and savages than to an adult civilized man. They excel in fickleness, inconstancy, absence of thought and logic and incapacity to reason. I hope no one is going to tweet this as my words. <laughs> but um, for, for, for me, many of the, the more modern... Um, <laughs> French. <laughs> um, so I think much of the modern research of, uh, of uh, correlating brain size with various cognitive capacities is actually of a, of a similar level, if less provocatively um, phrased. There are many problems. Uh, one is the question of how brain size should be measured. And you will find in this field that it's quite convenient that there are multiple measures for you to pick from. If one doesn't work, um, you, can, you can just pick another one. So some people pick overall brain mass. If that doesn't work, pick volume or the size of a specific brain area, or do you divide one area by the rest of the brain? Or in some cases, people divide two areas by two other areas, and so on and so on. It's, you're, you're severely under-constrained if there's an infinity of measures for you to, um, to um, calculate brain size. <coughs> and likewise, there are equally many um, definitions around for cognitive capacity. So um, here's an example on, of how someone's tried to define intelligence. Um, in this case, the, um, the um, e emphasis seems to be of, on speed of how animals solve problems and to survive in their natural and social environment. Now, let's examine speed. Some others have examined learning speed and have dismissed it, but based on a peculiar idea. Here's a meta-analysis of a variety of different animal species of the number of trials reach, needed in a color discrimination task to, to reach a criterion. And bees were the fastest among these, um, so they required two trials, um, various species of fish, four trials, um, birds about 10, and the worst of these were human infants with 28. Okay, so far so good. Now Pierce, in, an, in a relatively um, eminent textbook, makes the point that you can't therefore use learning speed as a measure of intelligence because humans don't top the chart. Okay, so there might be good reasons for dismissing learning speed as a criterion for intelligence, but the fact that it doesn't give you the answer you want shouldn't be a criterion. That's the last one that you want. Okay, but that's I think uh, is is indicative of uh, the many circularities that you find in this particular area. I just found uh, a new one which I like better in part because um, it's been written by smart people about a paper of ours. So this is by um, Sophie Karen and uh, Larry Abbott about our recent um, model of the, the insect mushroom body. And they suggest that intelligence um, involves combining pieces of evidence to reach non-obvious conclusions. And they say that <coughs> recent, our recent study um, um, indicates that you can find the seat of intelligence in the insect mushroom body. What we actually did is we used a relatively um, simple model. Um, so um, here again for, well, I, I think a reminder is useful even for those of you who were here, is the frontal view of a bee's head with the brain inside it. Um, these antennae here are, are an insect nose and there's a variety of different um, olfactory receptors. Uh, like receptors project to glomerularly in the antennal lobes and their, their um, um, inputs are summed up, essentially increasing signal-to-noise ratios. And then there are projection neurons from these antennal lobes to the mushroom bodies, which are centers of multisensory integration in learning and memory. And there's a kind of um, um, fan-out, fan, 
fan in architecture in that there are relatively few projection neurons, lots and lots of mushroom body intrinsic cells, Kenyan cells, um, and then a, a, a severe convergence on, um, on um, output neurons again. Now, the, 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 I think the key point, it's a very simple model, but the key point is that none of the aspects of the model are tweaked to mimic any kind of behavioral affordance, okay? The only thing we've done is we've stuck in um, empirical information from our neurobiology colleagues, but without asking the model to do anything for us. Because I think that's often if I talk to my engineering um, colleagues uh, who take a kind of more robotics type of view, that is they, they, they tweak a model until it works because they perceive that as their task, which is fine for some purposes, but actually it doesn't tell you anything about um, how any particular animal does it. So essentially we asked if we stick only neurobiological information into the model, then what kind of behavioral affordances pop out of it? And the, um, the um, ideas that we put into the model are number one, random convergence of the um, um, of, um, of um, projection neurons to mushroom body Kenyan cells, um, then the, the, the sparsening that goes on at that interface um, and associative learning, both at the input as well as at the output of the mushroom body Kenyan cells. And remarkable, with that very um, simple architecture, um, we um, generated a simple pop-up phenomena without any, doing anything further to this model, a variety of um, what were previously perceived as higher order learning phenomena that go beyond making um, simple associations, such as, for example, positive patterning, where um, you um, reward a mixture of, of two stimuli, but are able to discriminate that mixture from its individual components, A and B. Um, the inverse side of, side of that, so that the mixture AB is unrewarded, and the two individual components are um, are distinguished from that, which I guess for computer people is called the XOR problem, or peak shift. Um, for peak shift, I've actually borrowed the figure from Karen and Abbott's very nice um, dispatch because it's, it's actually better than the figure that we used. Um, so what, what happens in peak shift, or rather what happens if you don't have peak shift is if you train animals to um, a certain stimulus, such, such as this blue-red um, mixture flower here, then, and then ask them how they um, respond to similar stimuli so you get a, a sort of Gaussian curve of generalization to um, both sides of, uh, in terms of decreasing similarity, the response also decreases. If, on the other hand, um, you reward animals on this stimulus but give them a penalty on something that's a little bit off to one side, such as in this case the pure red flowers, um, then if you subsequently ask the animal what it likes best, it's no longer the stimulus that it was rewarded on, but something that's actually moved further away from the rewarded stimulus to, um, from, uh, in the direction away from the penalized stimulus, so that, say, bees might, in this case, pick the blue flower over the blue-red mixture flower. And it turns out that this peak shift phenomenon also just pops out of this simple three-layer architecture. So there you get some fairly, what psychologists at least would perceive as, as higher order um, learning phenomena from a really basal architecture. So what you often um, do find in bigger and bigger brained animals is that the neurons are simply bigger. Okay, so in bigger animals, you need to carry your signal over larger distance, and you want to do that with some sensible speed. So here's a classic figure from Purvis and Lichtman, 1985, where they, can, they looked at homologous um, motor neurons in a variety of um, small mammals to larger mammal species, and found that the only thing they differ in is, um, is actually their, their overall size, um, but not their complexity. So if you ask, um, stepping back from, from cognition for a moment and just ask questions about behavior, then behavior, of course, is nothing but the precisely timed sequential activation of muscle. So in that sense, um, the, the toolkit that you can, that you can use to generate behavior um, um, diversity is, of course, uh, the number of, of skeletal muscles that you might find in any one animal. And what you see if you analyze 
um, the, the, the numbers of mussels in a variety of mammal species marked in black compared with um, the locust and insect species is what the locust is slightly inferior to a primate, um, just so, um, but, and to a weasel, but, um, but uh, quite um, impressively superior to, say, rats, hares, elks, and opossum. So the toolkit is mini miniaturized in that sense, um, but, but um, the, the, the locust rivals um, the most... Um, the best equipped mammals in having about 300 skeletal mus muscles. So how can you define complexity? And of course, that's, it's tricky, but I guess one suggestion by Mark Shangizi here is um, that a system is essence, essentially more complex if it can go, do more kinds of things. And for that, we can ask um, the classic, classic ethology um, literature, um, just measuring behavior repertoires um, across species. And of course, um, well, you might say this is not, not directly comparable, but at least there is a diversity of studies of specialists who've stared long and hard at, at their, their pet animals and have given everything, every recognizable behavior routine, a verb or a recognizable um, um, name and classified it. And if you do that, then you find that while well, human children or bottlenose dolphins um, outcompete some insects, perhaps just so by a factor of two or three um, in terms of stereotype behavior um, routines. Okay, so a dolphin wins against the bee there. Um, but if you compare, if you put that in some relation to neuron numbers, then a brief reminder that a bee has less than a million or fewer, um, whereas, say, a human has, a, has close to 100 billion. Okay. Where, where are you um, because possibly those were the data that I looked up in the literature. So I, I didn't collect these data. These were just unbiased samples from what's out there. How do you define distinct motor routines? Is it a matter of subdividing one into sub so? Yes. So, uh, and, and that's difficult, and there are lots of pitfalls, obviously. So, I mean, in some cases it might be obvious. So, say, humans have two gates, horses have three. Um, but, of course, in many cases, behaviors are complex and nested within one another, and then the distinction is much more difficult. Um, so this is only unbiased in so far as this wasn't designed as a comparative study. This is just collecting data from across the literature of separate studies where people in the first half of the 20th century have classified behavior routines. Now, I thought I should say some things about rodents because there are so many rodent people here. But um, So um, I'm going to say some things about spatial memory. And of course, as you're well aware, um, the rodent hippocampus is, is thought to, have, as one of its functions, um, to um, hold information not just about the animal's spatial um, um, position relative to familiar landmarks, but also contains information about the um, the direction the animal is oriented in um, and indeed allows animals to find novel shortcuts um, in the same way as a, as a physical map, for example, does. And one of the, the classic studies relating brain size to um, a structure in... Um, a, a brain, brain or, or a, stru a structure, a brain structure size to behavioral ecology needs um, is, is the rodent hippocampus in... Um, these two um, species of voles. Uh, this is a classic paper highly cited from um, early 1990s. And there are these two species, meadow voles and pine voles, um, which differ um, in home range, range sizes and in um, meadow voles, but not pine voles. There's also a difference in home range between male and, um, and females. And they also all differ in their hippocampus size. So there's, there's a correlation. It's not a fantastic one with um, four data points that are also not fully independent, but okay, so then be that as, as it may, in this case, larger home ranges are correlated with a larger hippocampus. So far, so good. Um, but you mess it up a little bit if you insert a honeybee into the same chart. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a honeybee's, this is not a honeybee's home range size. This is a honeybee's range that from which it can find its way home after a single orientation flight. Okay, this is a baby honeybee that's only been out there once, a single time for 20 minutes, and come back home. After that single orientation flight, 
the honeybee's home range is over here, um, whereas all the rodents have no home range. On the same linear scale, their home ranges are so small that they disappear. Yet, of course, you can fit a honeybee, um, an entire honeybee brain multiple times over um, into these rodents' hippocampus. Now, we say, well, you can't compare that because obviously it doesn't really matter what size anything is. You want to do what kind of operations an animal can do inside that home range. Um, well, yes, that's certainly true, but that also applies when you make the comparison between these different rodents, which the authors in this case haven't done. Um, but, of course, there is a fairly um, venerable literature on, on bee navigation in their, um, in, in, in their environment. And, and, and to, to this, this state, there's actually nothing... Um, I'm not aware of any cognitive operation in, uh, in spatial environments that bees can't do and, and rodents can. Sorry, this is fairly poor resolution. Um, but, okay, so um, just uh, to recapitulate, bees are central place foragers, so they are distinguished from many other insects in that they have a location to which they must return um, because if they um, fail at that task, then, of course, it has fairly catastrophic consequences, especially in solitary bees, but also at least for the individual in social species. And, um, and home ranges, so say the old city of Jerusalem would be a fairly diminutive um, size for a, a bee home range. Um, honeybees will fly up to 10 kilometers away. Um, bumblebees typically two to three kilometers. Um, so there's some variation, but, um, but certainly um, across this range, so back to in the 19th century, Jean-Henri Fabre did these beautiful experiments where he displaced um, solitary bees, in that case, several kilometers away from their natal nests and up to two to three kilometers, they would reliably um, find their way home. So a rodent's home range might be this building here or something like that, um, whereas bees obviously find their way easily across this map. Now, for, it's not trivial if you actually think about it, because for most... Um, Westerners, if you um, drop them somewhere in this part up there, for example, actually it's not so easy to find your way around unless you're um, quite experienced in that environment. And the task is actually easier in any urban environment because urban environments are typically designed to be recognizable. Okay? People build buildings often with the intent, intent to make them unique um, and and therefore they're, 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 they can be used as unique landmarks, whereas, of course, um, a natural bee environment might be closer to this, um, minus the cuts that humans have made into this, this pine forest. So if you're a bee foraging from a flower patch here, you might have to remember that your nest is somewhere under a pine tree over there, and that pine tree will look pretty, pretty close to um, tens of thousands of others um, in the, in the area. So it's not a trivial task. And the way we um, study this nowadays is with, um, actually this doesn't need sound, but um, with um, harmonic radar. And so the, sorry, the equipment is slightly disproportional in, a, in relation to our um, experimental animal. Um, it's called harmonic radar because bees aren't, oh, turn the sound off. Um, bees aren't um, large enough to carry anything battery driven, so we can't use a GPS system. Um, so what we're using is, is called a transponder. This is not a, um, not a transmitter. And it's a transponder because it essentially bounces back a frequency that's emitted from the bottom radar dish and then a harmonic is, is received from the, from the top radar dish. Um, and for that, we can, uh, with that technology, we can study things like how bees um, maneuver in situations where they have to link multiple distinct foraging locations so uh, equivalent to a simple traveling salesman problem where, um, where, well, as the name suggests, the traveling salesman problem is the problem that a traveling salesman faces, i.e. to link multiple destinations in such a way as to minimize travel time and travel distance. And that, of course, is something that in, uh, in bees, natural environments will often happen. So here we've mimicked that situation. The hive is here with five um, um, locations marked in blue that the bee needs to um, link in an optimal order. And here's an early track of an inexperienced individual, and you can see that's a bit uh, messy. Green, by the way, is early in the track, orange in the middle, 
red is late. But that's an inexperienced individual. And what happens if you give a B multiple opportunities? So that's a heat map where the truck fades after a short time. So you can see how it develops. So here's the hive. Here are the first two foraging locations. Now she's discovered two more. And now she's discovered the fifth. We're into the tenth bout now. So these are sequential foraging bouts after the bees returned. Um, but it's still, at the moment, it's still a bit all over the place. But you can see the paths are gradually straightening by about about 25. Um, and in the end, um, they're getting pretty close to the optimal solution there, or indeed typically find it. So over time, um, with a few dozen foraging bots, sorry, um, you, uh, the bees will manage this traveling salesman. Yeah, I have a question. Is this based on visual? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I can el elaborate later, but um, okay. Um, so yes, they, they need vision in order to navigate. Um, if we um, let bees operate in, uh, as they want to, so this is, this is a hive um, of, with, with bees that are just allowed to forage from natural food sources, um, then, then this is the kind of picture that you get from a naive individual that's never seen the light of day before, before we started to monitor it. So in this case, we're tracking individuals over their entire lifetimes, from the very first moment they're leaving the hive um, to their death, essentially. Um, and so you can see here orientation flights. Here's the hive, and the bee makes loops in varied directions, always returning back to the hive, and then a loop in a different direction, um, during which they acquire both landmark information um, as well as information about suitable food sources. You can also see, I'll just mention that we'll, speak, we'll come back to this um, later, that here there is a, 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 path, a forward, forward edge to which that bee has made two excursions in these two in these two early foraging bouts. I mean, she won't visit them for a while again now. Because on the second day, so these are its uh, flights um, 3 to 82, uh, there's one more excursion loop in this direction where she actually hasn't been the day before, then she's discovered something good. Okay? And now that bee makes um, several dozen excursions, only ever visiting one patch. Um, then there were a few rainy days where the bee couldn't go out, um, and then once she um, um, left the hive again, a few days later, she made one more excursion to this particular location, found, oh, this is actually not quite as good as I remember it, turns back um, to the hive, and then flies back to a location that it had only visited 10 days earlier on its first excursions. Okay? Um, and then stays with that particular patch um, for... Um, the rest of its life, and then at some point she just dis disappeared off the radar from a regular bout, so it was probably picked up by some insectivorous bird or something like that. Um, so this bee was a very organized, um, rigorous worker with just two patches. Other bees are more all over the place. We had a single individual that actually never settled down on any particular location um, and spent its life um, more, much more exploratory. Now, within such environments... Um, We've also done experiments in which we were interested in asking how landmarks influence um, bees' navigation. And for that, of course, you need relatively featureless terrain and you need to bring your own um, landmarks. So we built up these, um, these tetrahedral-shaped tents. And in this particular experiment, so that we did all kinds of experiments, for example, where the landmarks were individually different because we were interested in sequence learning and so on. But this is a kind of counting task in which we had a hive over here and bees were trained to find food between the third and the fourth landmark. Um, this is a commentary by Dev Berry about that, uh, that um, experiment. Um, and he um, reported that Lars and Carl set up various landmarks between a beehive and a bee feeder. After the bees had located the feeder, Lars and Carl started changing the locations of the feeder and landmarks. A surprising result, Lars and Carl were both killed by eyeball stings. <laughs> Um, but actually, we, we did survive the eye wall stings. Um, and so this is what we, what we actually did. So we did change the locations because bees finding the original training location as it is training setup. So the hives over here, one, two, three landmarks, you want to land here. Um, so the majority of bees indeed land after the third landmark, but that's just the baseline because obviously at that stage they could have learned both the training distance as well as the correct number of landmarks. And you know from... Um, my um, explorations about the, of the bee dance language that certainly they can learn distance even in the absence of landmarks. So we need to produce a contradiction and that's what we did here. So we had, um, we in this case in, increased the number of landmarks from three to four and in that case the majority of bees would still fly 
to the training distance, but a slightly elevated, although significantly elevated number now landed earlier um, after the third landmark. And if we um, made the discrepancy even larger, so that there are now five landmarks between the hive and the original training distance, the vast majority of bees chose a compromise between correct distance and correct number. So that was a, they were statistically relatively weak, these effects, but they were there, and at a time that I think was a bit of a surprise, because at, until then people have just thought of bees as simple associative learners that would, say, memorize that blue means reward or ger geranium means reward, um, but it was the first excursion, I guess, into something more cognitive. Now, is it surprising in computational terms? Again, um, I suspect not. Here's a classic model from the Hanon Changeux um, from the 1990s asking essentially the question of what, uh, what do you minimally need in order to um, count up to seven in this case? And uh, long story short, they needed 530 independently um, firing units in order to um, calculate to five, essentially with um, zero percent error. So again, in terms of neurocomputational terms, counting isn't actually um, necessarily that impressive. Now, before we go too far, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here trying to impress you with how clever bees are, because I think that sort of perspective leads slightly in the wrong way in comparative cognition, and especially um, corvid and primate people are just obsessed with finding human-like things in their animals. And I think the danger is that we're replacing a, a, a flawed world we, evolutionary perspective where somehow um, humans are at the pinnacle and everything else is arranged underneath um, with an equally ludicrous perspective um, where everything's the same, um, which is also, I think, um, relatively unhelpful. We had um, Noam Chomsky over a few years ago um, at Queen Mary, and he said something that I liked very much, so I'll read it back to you. Um, on these kinds of efforts in comparative cognition. He said, there's been a lot of effort in comparative psychology to try to show that non-humans, usually primates, have some human, human cognitive capacities. I think that's a very strange study, frankly. There's a lot of work trying to laboriously teach poor chimpanzees how to act like little humans. This is based on the implicit hypothesis, which makes absolutely no sense, that somehow apes are less evolved humans. This work makes about as much sense as trying to teach humans to, the, to do the waggle dance of the bees. And indeed, it is a slightly strange approach, um, especially if you consider um, other perspectives that also exist in um, comparative biology. And, and that's, uh, for example, in sensory biology. I mentioned John Lubbock um, two days ago, who um, originally discovered that... Um, that insects can see ultraviolet light in the 19th century, so that where we might see a unique uh, uh, um, uh, a, a petal that is, is yellow from one end to the other, um, bees actually see two colors, where the, the center is UV absorbing and the periphery um, is yellow plus UV reflecting. And he um, said poignantly, perhaps, that, um, that what we see depends mainly on, on what we look for. So if in comparative cognition we just look for human-like um, abilities, then that's all we're ever going to find, and it's boring. And in sensory biology, of course, no one would actually, no one in their right minds would actually do that. You wouldn't set out um, on a project saying, can I, fly, can I find a, can I, an animal species that perceives color or scent um, exactly like humans do. That wouldn't actually be a very rewarding effort um, at all. And Carbon Fish certainly wouldn't have discovered, say, the bee dance language had he set out without looking at a particular animal for decades um, to find something like a symbolic language in the animal kingdom. So what's different, actually? Um, so one of the things um, that we think are different is that bees don't seem to be very good identifying things at a glance. I've mentioned um, image recognition, or specifically um, face, or the recognition of um, human f images of human faces that you find by bees. So this is, again, the kind of setup that bees in flight, scanning um, a human face. There's a little um, droplet of sucrose solution, if she gets it right. Um, and they don't find, fly straight to the target. You often find extensive scanning. This is the path of the bee, I think, with the... Uh, 
uh, a data point every um, 20 milliseconds uh, as to where the, the bee is actually looking. And you find that in also more biologically realistic tasks. So here's a, um, a task where the bee has to detect a cryptic crab spider that's sitting on the flower. And you can see when the bees are aware of this predation threat that they always make these side-to-side -side peering movements before deciding where to land. And so it appears that unless bees are extremely highly trained and feel safe that there's no predation threat, um, these scanning movements are actually essential for recognizing any kind of pattern. Um, but we explored that further um, by taking away the possibility of bees to scan a pattern. And this is an experiment where we used um, a computer screen on which stimuli were um, presented um, for increasingly brief durations up to only 20 milliseconds. And bees had no problem with um, simple discrimination such as presence, absence of a diagonal bar or, or indeed angle orientation if the um, bars were strongly were diametrically opposed. They also didn't have any difficulties with um, colors that were highly um, distinguishable. But if we presented them with any slightly tougher pattern recognition tasks, such as, for example, distinguishing whether there was a, um, a yellow crab spider um, that, exhibited a pre, uh, that was associated with predation risk um, or a yellow flower of the same area, they completely failed. If the stimuli were presented in any other form than in static presentation. Okay, oriented bars, 20 milliseconds, fine. Green versus orange, 20 milliseconds, fine. Pattern, 20 milliseconds doesn't work, 50 milliseconds doesn't work, 100 milliseconds doesn't work, any interruption doesn't work. They have to be able to scan over it while it's there in order to see it. Otherwise, it's not there. They failed. And so we actually have no idea whether bees even see images. And that might sound a bit peculiar, um, given that they've been tested on so many different pattern discrimination tasks. So bees have been tested on all kinds of um, um, relatively um, complex pattern vision, vision tasks. So here's a number of pairs, all of which uh, bees can be trained to discriminate. So this is top rows, the uh, CS pluses and the CS minuses are on the bottom. And we built a, a relatively um, simple model based on very simple feature detectors to see if this task could actually be solved without any kind of internal image representation. Um, so the tasks that have been tested are don't, don't often, on, on which bees have been tested often don't just involve um, recognizing a particular pattern, but a common stimulus property. So for example, um, that in a variety of uh, training bouts, bees will be exposed to um, a variety of patterns which have a common feature, which in this case is the um, angular orientation of stripes. Um, in this particular direction. And if you train them on these two, um, then the bees will subsequently choose this and this and this and this, but not any of these three patterns. Okay? And, and so what people have um, gleaned from that in the 1990s and so on um, were relatively cognitively loaded um, um, interpretations where people have said, well, that means that bees don't memorize these images on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis, but that instead they are able to um, extract rules that link all of these patterns and allow them to classify these as um, one common group, whereas these are um, put in a, in, a, in a separate category. But our question was, do we actually need a, 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 an interpretation that involves categorization or, or classification, or can we get by with something very simple? And what's been known for a good number of years is that bees have two types of um, orientation sensitive neurons in, their, um, in the lobula, the third visual ganglion, um, which are angled roughly 120 degrees be between each other. Um, and only these two f um, types of, um, of orientation sensitive um, neurons have so far been found in bees. And so Mark Roper um, constructed a model, again, based on, um, on all the information that we could get from our neuroscientists colleagues. So here's our lamina viewing. Um, or, or the eye viewing a, a particular pattern. And then in the med medulla, we have um, some, some um, feature detectors. And these um, edge orientation detectors in the lobula are, um, are marked in these colors here. And they're in turn connected via projection neurons to the mushroom body um, Kenyan cells. And again, in this case, the task 
for us was not to build a model that would replicate known behavioral affordance, but to build a model that was just based on what we know about the electrophysiological properties of these feature detectors, and to ask, well, if you had that system, um, then what can you do? And of course, an ideal model, um, you might say, would replicate both B's um, positive um, capacities as well as their, their failures. And so um, there are also some tasks that bees seem to be poor at, surprisingly, if you compare them to what they can do. So they, they have no dis, um, difficulty discriminating this from that, 73% correct, or this from this, 88% correct. But for some reason, this compared to this, they seem to fail, at least to, according to some studies from the 1990s. And you might say, at least if you take a sort of conventional view to modeling, then a good model would replicate both uh, the failures as well as um, the, um, the successes. And that isn't quite what Mark found with his model. So um, he used, uh, he, for all of these models, he used only these edge orientation detectors. Um, but he tried a variety of different ways of wiring them up with the mushroom bodies. In some cases, there was di direct inhibition between these edge detectors, sometimes not, um, and so on. So there were a variety of at least plausible solutions um, how um, these edge orientation um, neurons might be wired up with the mushroom bodies. All of these possibilities are marked here in different colors, um, and each dot is, is one particular performance. And this is the actual empirically determined behavior result. This is the model result. Okay, so a really nice model, one that perhaps you've actually tweaked to um, generate the behavior you want to. All the dots would sit on this line. Okay, that clearly is not at all what happens. What happens instead is that pretty much all of the points are above the line. What does that mean? It means that even these excessively primitive models that are so simple as to be caricatures of what really goes on in the visual lobes of the bees, all of, pretty much all of these model, models are better than the real bees at these pattern discrimination tasks. None of these models assume that the bee sees an image. There's no internal representation of any of these patterns, nor any abstracted features, nor any categorization. It's the most primitive system that you could imagine, and we let it loose on all these patterns that people have thought indicate um, pattern classification, categorization, and so on. These models do better than our real bees. Okay? So that indicates that bees might be doing something very different. And one um, task where we've recently um, explored that possibility is counting. So we've returned back to um, this, uh, this old ideas of uh, sensitivity to, to number, um, which um, vertebrates are often surprisingly good at. Here's a little video by Kohler on a, on a, where he tested a variety of different animals. In this case, a squirrel. So the squirrel there looked at the number six, and as you saw, it shot right out and picked this particular target, even though, of course, the arrangement there of the dots is different. And Kohler, of course, tried, tried a variety of um, um, different animals as well as, um, as uh, making sure that the task couldn't be solved by area covered or um, the shape of the stimulus and so on. So the point is, so now it's a, a five. The, oops, now it froze. Um, anyway, so the task now would be to run out to this particular stimulus, um, and, and the, the squirrel does that equally quickly. So what clearly seems to be going on is that the squirrel glances at what's available and then shoots right to it. Okay? And this kind of seeing at a glance, you might already suspect um, bees might have difficulties with that, given what I've told you earlier about sequential scanning. So the training protocol um, that we used here is one where it was a simple task so that the bee had to, bees had to, um, to distinguish twos from fours. And this is work in progress. We've only tested a handful of bees so far, but uh, I'll run that by you anyway. So. Um, during sequential training bouts, let's say a bee trained two always got rewarded on twos, not fours, um, but the actual twos that they got presented with and rewarded on were different from one bout to the next. So in the first bout, it might be circles, then stars, um, then larger circles, and so on. And then, um, then they get an unrewarded task where um, they, they have to distinguish two, twos from fours and a variety of transfer tests 
um, where now the common features are the correct numbers, but the actual individually encountered items in the patterns um, are different ones. And here's how a bee behaves in that sort of task. So this bee is looking for a two. She's scanning this one, one, two, three. Um, now moving away again to this one, scanning, scanning, scanning. And now she's finding a two. And now she's touching it. Okay, so we're measuring the touches as, as positive decisions. Um, there's no reward in this particular test. So what you could see there is that the, clearly, as opposed to the squirrel earlier on, the bee is not directly shooting um, to, to the correct target, but, um, but um, it examines not just each pattern, but each item in every pattern to see if it's got the correct number. So it's a sequential scanning of all of these items. And so what we're interested in, of course, is whether the bees essentially manage to solve this task by memorizing the pattern, the motor patterns, the flight patterns that the visual input makes them perform. So here's an example of, the, of a transfer test. So again, this bee is, oh, she's just crushed. She's just, um, she's looking for twos. And now she's look, there, there is a presentation of stimuli that she actually has never encountered before. So she's scanning a four, another four rejected. And there she's. Um, touching the, the two, even though she's never been rewarded on two blue dots, um, and now she's moving on to a yellow, again, making a correct choice. But the point there is, is that no matter how long we train these bees, they never zoom straight to the pattern. They always have to tick off the items sequentially. And so if um, you um, monitor these paths to generate heat maps of the bees' scanning behavior, um, for these different patterns, then, then this is the kind of pattern, this is for a single individual, no, two, two individuals, one um, trained on two, one on four, um, that they exhibit when they encounter the two types of patterns. And first of all, what you can see is that bees' behavior clearly differs depending on whether they're looking at a four versus a two. So uh, when they're looking at twos, the, um, the scanning pattern is much less wide-ranging. But also, interestingly, when um, their, um, the, the pattern, when looking at a two, differs depending on whether they've actually been trained to two or four. So this individual that's been trained to two um, just essentially scans one item intensively, then another one briefly, and then just lands. Very quick decision. Whereas this individual that's looking at a two but looking for four, you can see that there are multiple centers and it's much more wide-ranging than the other one that's been looking at a two. Sorry. Can the scanning be related to size? Uh, stimuli, compared to the squirrel that was very small and for the bees, not very big, so it has to scan around? Um, I mean, we, we varied the size of these stimuli and they managed the task independently of the size. But are you saying that if we'd made them all a lot smaller, um, a then it could have... Huge stimuli for the squirrel. Can you mm. Um, that's an interesting possibility, and the honest answer is we haven't tested that. Um, you have to imagine that, of course, a bee's visual spatial resolution is quite poor. So we can't make them extremely small or they won't see the patterns. So we have to ensure that they actually subtend, subtend a, a su sufficient angle to be detectable at all. But we could make them smaller than we've done here. That's true, of course. Oh, we've done that. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's clearly a necessary um, control. But my, my point here is, is not one of whether bees can solve it. The interesting thing for us, I think, is that there seems to be a fundamentally different way of solving the task to how a vertebrate would typically solve it. And that's the interesting thing. So the, 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 number, the list of animals that can do these counting tasks um, is in, in the several dozen. Okay? I don't think there's any mileage in just demonstrating that further, even small-brained animals can solve such tasks. What fascinates me here is how they do it and that it looks as if they might do it in a completely different way from, from a vertebrate who can do these small numbers entirely by parallel processing without the need for sequential scanning. That's, my, that's what fascinates me here. <laughs> So, 
to um, wrap this up, what, what do you actually get with bigger brains? Possibly what can you do better with a larger than bee-brained animal um, or nervous system? So first of all, I think a lot of the um, increases that you do get with um, larger um, brains are actually fairly boring as, as the type of example that I'd shown with uh, the motor neurons earlier is you just get in bigger animals and bigger, uh, with bigger brains you get larger neurons. Okay, there's no increase in complexity whatsoever. It's simple biophysical uh, constraints that force you to do that. But what you might get um, possibly in larger brain animals is, is more parallel processing, more possibilities of seeing at a glance and less need for um, the sequential scanning um, in order to inquire, acquire visual spatial information. But we're only at the beginnings of that. But we're, the, the fascinating thing, I think, is that we're doing, we, we, we have indications that there's more going on than just uh, the bee being a slightly less clever variant um, of much larger brain animals, but a completely different way of representing the environment. Now, in larger brains, you might obviously also get um, higher storage capacity, and that is clear in the, the, the hippocampus type example, um, where to my knowledge, at least the, the wiring diagrams are, are highly stereotypic. What you do get in, in a larger hippocampus is, is, is more storage capacity equivalent to a bigger hard drive, but not necessarily um, a better um, processor, if you want to use that computer analogy. Now, in larger brain animals, you might also get, in some cases, better signal-to-noise ratios, less interference, less of a need to throw old memories away in favor of, um, of new ones. But whether you get more intelligence or, or flexibility or plasticity and so on, um, perhaps on an evolutionary scale, only to the extent that in larger brains you can add in new modules that allow you to do novel things, but only then, I think, do you have substantial advances in, in cognitive capacity. I'll conclude with a quotation by Ramoni Cajal, who actually did compare um, bee brains directly with some vertebrate brains um, and um, observed the following. So he compared fish and amphibians with, with um, various insects. And if one does that, so he says, one experiences an extraordinary surprise. The excellence of the psychic machine does not increase with zoological hierarchy. Instead, one realizes that in fish and amphibians, the nervous centers have undergone an unexpected simplification. Of course, their gray matter has increased considerably in mass. But when the structure of their brains is compared with that of bees or dragonflies, they're excessively plain, coarse, and rudimentary. It is as if one were to pretend to hold as equals the merits of a rough grandfather clock with the quality of a fine pocket watch, a marvel of fineness, delicacy, and precision. As always in building her marvelous works, nature distinguishes herself much more in her tiny creations than in the large. This, by the way, is a drawing by Ramoni Cajal of um, an insect visual system, Lamina Medulla Lobula, and it's actually it's amazing how little we've actually learned since these first drawings of um, the the um, um, insect visual connect home. Thanks very much. Yeah, so the, the interesting thing is that um, at very low numbers, in vertebrates at least, um, you find a phenomenon called subitizing, subitizing where um, the, the precision is exact, so you can distinguish one from two exactly as well as three from four. But at, num at numbers higher than that, um, it, becomes, it follows Weber's law, essentially. So you recognize proportions 
but not absolute numbers. So one from two is not, or seven from eight is not as easy as, uh, as, easy as one from two. And we don't seem to find, so that there is a distinction for vertebrates in that they're faster at making at a glance judgments for these very low numbers, but not for bees. So bees need, need the time to scan them sequentially even for low numbers. Above numbers of, five, uh, of four bees also fail, uh, as many animals do, unless you make, um, you double the numbers or something. So four versus eight, of course, they can do. Sorry? So it is a law, a form of labor law. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the reason that humans escape that law is essentially, in my view, just because we have number labels. So once you can tick, once you have a system to apply um, verbal labels to numbers, then of course 9 from 10 is as easy as 3 from 4. It just takes longer because you have to go over them sequentially. Oh. What, what, what can they do? The, the very, very small ones. What can they do? Can they so, count it? So, what no, I don't, I don't. So, Polyvov, the, the paper that, um, the, from which that figure stems, um, has only analyzed their neurobiology and not their behavior. So, then let's go up in size then. Okay. Um, so, um, they, there are some that, that um, we've studied with some Dutch colleagues who are at least small enough to have spent their entire development inside a butterfly egg, okay? And, and they have um, olfactory short-term and long-term memories for oviposition sites. So you can, uh, at least at the very basal level, they can remember how something smelled where they've um, su su um, successfully oviposited. Um, but, if, but, but no one's tested whether they can, say, pull strings or something like that, um, as in the talk that I um, delivered the last time. Um, there are some of the, the um, somewhat larger ones which have extremely good spatial memory um, of, amongst these digger wasps, for example, but they're not, they're not amongst these um, superlatively small ones. What's superlative with these fairy wasps um, is in part also their nervous system in that many of their neurons actually don't seem to have cell bodies. And how they do that, and there must be some sort of a... Um, connection between cells in order to, pro to get prote proteins across membranes or something like that. It's quite remarkable. They have very unique nervous systems. But, um, so to come to think of it, of course, some of the other work on extremely small-brained animals is on spiders, um, which from, from um, the, the tiniest versions that just emerge from the egg to the adult are often multiple orders of magnitude difference, different um, not just in body size, but also in terms of brain size. And it turns out this is um, work by West Eberhardt and Bill Weisler and so on. Um, is that in term, so what people have looked at is, is their orb weaving capacity and the plasticity that these um, spiders have at repairing orbs or webs if you damage them, but also to build them into unusual spaces um, when, you, when you constrain them. And there seems to be absolutely no difference between the tiniest versions and the really large versions in that sort of plasticity. And remarkably, the, the very tiny ones, um, the one way in which they are different is the disproportionate allocation to brain space because the brain isn't then, in these tiniest versions, um, constrained to the head but spills over in not just the main body but also into the upper legs. So their brain is, 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 is filling up half their little bodies. And, uh, and as they increase in size, it gets pushed further and further into the head, basically. Can I push you a little bit further and ask whether you'd be willing to specula speculate about awareness versus performance? Do any of these small creatures have something that, that might resemble what we call awareness? Um, I don't know is the honest answer. Um, I've just been invited to um, perhaps to, for, for, to get me thinking about this sort of thing to, for, to a, a conference about consciousness, and I have not the least of an idea what I'm going to tell people. But um, so one one measure of um, consciousness that my um, vertebrate colleagues sometimes use in animals is metacognition, is is the awareness of your own knowledge uh, and its limitations. 
so um, they, they essentially measure whether their critters have any um, awareness of their certainty with which they can solve a task so that if, for example, they're unsure, they opt out and don't make a decision if there's a risk that they get penalized. And that has been um, examined in one, well, two years ago, PNAS paper by Clint Perry and Andy Barron, and they claim that they find such a, a metacognition-like ability in, in the bee. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not yet confident that there might be something like this. Um, so they, they, they can't focus their eyes. Um, so the, the, the compound eye essentially consists of um, lots of individual um, omatidia, little um, individual optical units, each of which corresponds to one pixel. Mm -hmm. um, and so that constrains them to a visual spatial resolution that's extremely poor. It's about 100 times worse than our own. Um, and, of course, I guess another difference is, um, so these eyes are looking pretty much all around. Um, they, of course, the um, opening angle is much wider than our eyes, um, which provides, I guess, some advantage in so far as you can look simultaneously forward and sideways, but um, it, it, cons it um, poses some difficulties for us because it means that patterns will look very, very dif different from when you're close by or when you're two centimeters to one side or 10 centimeters back so because they spread the over, the sorry? So it's like that when the file they see a general yellow and they need to go near to check if they are the dots. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Last question. Yeah, uh, I was wondering about whether a large animal has a more difficult task of coordinating its own activity like coordination between your left hand and right hand and, and so on. And that may be, uh, it, uh, it essentially pose a limit to how good a large animal can be in performing tasks. I mean, it's, it, neuroconductance becomes an increasing challenge the larger you are. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is certainly clear. Um, and it's, of course, the fact that therefore we need larger motor centers and larger motor neurons is actually not trivial if you think about it, at least from a kind of um, computer perspective, because, I mean, say, if you compare um, small and large animals that actually pretty much have to do the same thing, such as, say, a small fish with a blue whale, the motor tasks are essentially the same. It's up, left, uh, 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 up, down, left, right, mouth open, mouth closed, and so on. Um, and so if you took, say, if, you, if you're taking um, the parallel from controlling a jumbo jet versus a propeller plane, you don't actually necessarily need a much larger computer for operating a big plane, plane than a small one. But in biology, you do because of these biophysical constraints. But I'm not sure this, uh, if that no, answers I mean, your I mean question. The, the coordination between the legs mm -hmm. uh, of a very small, uh, tiny uh, spider mm -hmm. and a really very large spider, mm -hmm. the coordination between all the legs uh, is, is more difficult with, with the, I suppose, with the larger legs. Not necessarily if everything's just scaled they up. To, they have to grasp something. You know, all, all legs have to grasp something together. They Mm -hmm. But that that task is essentially the same in a small as in the large animal if if the motor tasks that are handled are essentially the same, just scaled up. Yeah, but the small, for the small animal, it's easier. Maybe. Okay, let's take okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much.